welcome to Forbidden Planet TV and on today's special episode we are here with Jay Christoph on publication day for Empire of the Damned. Hey. Hello Jay. Hey, it's good to see you. How you doing? Not too bad, not too bad. And it's so great to have you in on publication day. Yeah, this is in front of the wall of death. This, this is exactly the first time I've got to see the Forbidden Planet edition in the real. It turned out awesome. It uh, looks so nice as well next to Empire. Nice yeah. as when we were when we were building the wall yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> we were just like, this is amazing. No, this it's it's really very cool. well constructed. But yeah, yeah. The, the coffees hadn't arrived in Australia before I left. I like I took thirty hours to get here yesterday oh, from Lord, yeah okay. from Melbourne. So. But I've had my coffee, so it should be fine. We'll see how we go. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so for for anyone who hasn't read uh, Empire of the Vampire or anyone who needs like a quick recap, yeah, what what can you say about uh, the first book? The first book. So the first book is it's dark epic fantasy. It's about a world that has been plunged into an eternal night. No one quite knows why, but the sun doesn't shine as brightly anymore. Uh, and in this world, vampires are real and they've figured out that they can now walk around during the day without bursting into flames because my vampires are old school that way. Uh, and they slowly started popping up and taking over this country. And the book is about a guy named Gabriel Delion, who's the last of a kind of monastic brotherhood called the Silver Saints. They hunt monsters. And he's the last surviving member of the order and he begins the book in the captivity of the vampiric empress and he's kind of charged with the story of telling his life. So the first book is told in two different timelines. One, when he's young, he's kind of 15, 16 years old when he gets recruited into the order and he's kind of bright eyed and bushy tailed and full of the fire of belief that he can change the world. And the second part of the story, he's much older. He's kind of bitter and jaded and faithless and over the course of the book you find out how this boy became this very different man uh, but he gets dragged against his will in the older Gabe timeline into a quest to try and bring the sun back to the sky so that's the first book in a nutshell, <laughs> in a nutshell. <laughs> um, and it, it's what I obviously loved about uh, Empire the Vampire is seeing that kind of that change in that character and kind of how you have that almost coming of age where you have this very kind of idealistic like person who's just like I, I could I could save the world sure. I could be the hero and then you know it becomes very different yeah mm -hmm. yeah um, <laughs> yeah I kind of I kind of wanted to do a hero's journey but then explore the aftermath of becoming the hero like usually the book or the story ends uh, yes. you know you go and slay the dragon and take the gold and bring it back and that's where most traditional heroes journey ends I wanted to explore the aftermath uh, and in the second book, I kind of play around a little bit there with that as well. Gabe, you know, he was when he was in his prime, he was kind of this legendary figure. Um, but he took his bow and left the stage before the play had played mm. itself out. Uh, and so now he's kind of returning to places that he's been and seeing the actual aftermath of the things that he did when he was young and famous. Uh, and he kind of has to contend with a lot of that. So yeah, it's kind of deconstructing the idea of, of hero and myth. Which is fun. Mm. And it's definitely, I know quite a few people have compared it to Grimdark. It's definitely, you're bringing it back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what Grimdark is. Uh, I, hear that, I hear that term a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's dark fantasy. It's, it's a world with consequence. Terrible things happen to good people. Uh, the good guys don't always win. Not everybody makes it out alive. In mm. fact, most people don't. But I wanted it to be a world with real stakes and real peril like you're dealing with these supernatural creatures who are stronger and faster and they yeah. see you as food uh, and if you fall afoul of them you get you get treated the same way you or i treat the cow that we ate for dinner <laughs> last night um, so yeah i i wanted it to be a book with stakes and consequences and yeah bad things happen to nice people sometimes, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> i apologize for the incoming trauma yeah <laughs> and is there um such a high body count in Dam? Is it comparable uh, body count? It's probably, I don't know, I killed a lot of people in Dam, but um, Damned, I mean Damned is a part two and hopefully at least some of your faves survive through to part three. Uh, mm. Introducing a different batch of new characters with every subsequent mm. book gets a little bit hard, so I don't know, I didn't actually do a body count total. 
instead, uh, I, I think instead of brutal murder, book two is more about torture than anything else. I can't actually kill a lot of the principal <laughs> stakeholders because they need to be on the stage for the final act. So instead I have to amuse myself by just making their lives as miserable as possible, uh, which I think I do. So. <laughs> I think it's it's do you find it difficult to keep track because I know um I interview quite a few kind of horror authors and when they have the books where they're just like oh I'm just gonna kill a whole swathe of people off and then they get three chapters ahead and be like wait I'm gonna kill me by three chapters oh <laughs> I need to like he miraculously survived and he's, he's now back no like I you know whenever I take a character off the board I try and do it for a reason it's not just for shock value I'm trying mm. to tell a story uh and you know it, it could be the point of the death is to prove just how brutal the world is but usually i'm trying to up stakes or ratchet up tension or whatever so in my head the deaths yeah most of them pretty memorable so i haven't i haven't written characters that i had off and then subsequently resurrected i'm writing book three at the moment though and i did forget a couple of characters actually existed so um i, I yeah i have to keep notes in that respect but yeah no, uh, I'm pretty good at remembering murders. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember you saying with uh, Empire of the Vampire that it's kind of the first book you properly had to plan. Yeah, yeah. Have you had to like, this is now your writing method kind of going forward that you're going pretty to Pretty much, do. yeah. <laughs> um, like I I wrote all of the Nemonite books just making it up as I went along. I didn't really have, I, ha I had a bit of a skeleton in place, but I didn't have a plan. Uh, and I was kind of doing the same with Vampire, but it was getting so big and so sprawling, I was losing track of the story and it was just ballooning in size. So about halfway through writing it, I had to actually sit down and work out a roadmap that I could follow. Uh, and I wasn't you know, particularly good at that because I hadn't done a lot of it before. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd plotted a little bit with my co-authored stuff, because mm -hmm. obviously when you're co-authoring a book, your co-author needs to know what it is you're planning to do with character X just in case you, know, you kill character X and they had something <laughs> interesting to do with them later down the round. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I got better at plotting. And yeah, in book two, I drew myself a roadmap, but I'm not clever enough or not prescient enough to see all things. And yeah. so inevitably I will think of a cooler idea about five or six chapters in, and that will end up changing the entire plot. Uh, so I have to replot and replot. So for damned, I think I I think I probably did three or four attempts at the start of the novel. Mm -hmm. Once I had the start in place, everything else kind of fell into place as well. Uh, but I'm getting better at the more I do it, the better at it you get. Mm -hmm. So I'm so I'm writing book three at the moment, and I have so far stuck really well to the plot that I've laid out. Like oh. book three is going suspiciously well. Touch wood. <laughs> What's um, going on? It's actually going according <laughs> to plan. I'm waiting for the wheels to fall off. I could be singing a different tune in like a week from now, but. At the moment it's going, yeah, it's going well. So I guess it's like anything, the more you do it, the better you get. Mm. But I like to leave things open-ended. So I actually have no idea how the book is going to end yet. I have, I have, I have an idea of who will be on the stage when the final mm. act happens, but I don't know how it'll play out. So that in that way, I can still surprise myself. Yeah. Uh, and the, the book can take an unexpected turn. And I figure if I'm the author of it and I'm getting surprised and delighted by the things that are happening on the page and the characters doing, then hopefully the reader does mm -hmm. too. So it's kind of a marriage of plotting and pantsing at the same time. Because mm -hmm. yeah, like I say, I'm not smart enough. So <laughs> sometimes characters just do things you don't expect. It sounds like a weird thing to say, but when you live with characters for four or five years and you're headed a stretch, mm -hmm. You get to know them pretty well um, and sometimes yeah they will act in a way that you didn't anticipate and that could take the story in a really interesting direction so i, I try to be open to that kind of thing as well mm. just means you have to rewrite a lot yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and do you find yourself having to as well like some scenes you're just having to almost like you have to grudgingly let go because you'd be like oh, i really love that scene yeah. but now it doesn't make it any yeah sense. all the time i wrote there was <laughs> there was a really cool battle scene that i wrote for damn Mm. Um, it was one of the coolest battle scenes I think I had ever written and I had huge amounts of fun putting it together but then the characters did something that I didn't expect and that had almost backward ripples into the story so mm. I had to go back and reset uh, and that meant that, that battle scene had to be cut so I took bits and pieces of it and I worked the coolest parts of it into other battles in the book <laughs> but yeah there's like a whole deleted scene I think 
I think we actually put it in there for audio book, maybe, because oh, I liked it so much. They asked if okay. I had any had any deleted yeah. scenes, any any content that I wish had got into the book. Mm. So I think that made it in as like bonus material in the audio book. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, sometimes you just have to let it go because it doesn't work even yeah. if you like it. Uh, yeah, the the cutting room floor is kind of littered with bits <laughs> and pieces like that. <laughs> And we obviously have to touch on the very uh, imaginative um, cursing. Sure. <laughs> it's kind um, of a brand at this point. Yeah. Do, do you think it's it's uh, innate within you? Is it the Australian within you? I, sus I suspect it's an Australian thing. I don't know. Uh, I know uh, yeah, that's certainly our reputation internationally. I don't even notice it, but uh, that's because I hang out with other Australians, so it's kind of part of the course. Yeah, it's probably an Aussie thing. <laughs> Uh, but then, you know some of the some of the insults I got from English readers, mm. um, you know they would DM me on Instagram or whatever and send me their favourite curse words and I would say oh, that sounds cool so I'd work it in. So <laughs> the English are partially to blame as well. It's not just Australian. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I think that that's probably why the UK and Australia tend to get along quite well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we have a similar sense of humour. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, yeah, I suspect that's why. English people tend to like it. Yeah. Mm. What's been your favourite so far that you've kind of either in Vampire or Damned? That I've used yeah. or that I've been told? Oh, actually, that you've been told. The one that I've been told is Cockwombler, which was, <laughs> I, that was English. I had no idea what that was, but it just sound, it sounded cool, so I used it. I think, I don't know, is that a Wombles thing? Because we had the Wombles when I was a kid. We had ABC, so ABC in Australia is, you know, it's mostly yeah. BBC content, yeah. or at least it was when I was a kid. So we had the Wombles. Yeah, I'm the not sure if it's... I don't know if Cock Wombler is a thing. Uh, I don't know. Or whether it's like a Shakespeare, it's so many things like Shakespearean insults. I don't know, but I used it in the book, so... Because <laughs> <laughs> um, you can get the... Um, they do these books now, like Shakespearean insult things, so you can flip, oh, sure. you can flip yeah, right. different parts of the book and come up with a unique in insult. And they did, um, actually Harper did one for Deadpool a couple of years ago, which was okay. very fun. Yeah, I so, did I did actually look up a bunch of Shakespearean insults for book three. Because uh, it's kind of, there, there's a character who speaks in kind of anachronistic parlance. Mm -hmm. They have like old world language patterns. And so I wanted to borrow some like old school medieval style Shakespearean insults. So yeah, there's some good ones in there. <laughs> um, so I think we've like mentioned about influences and stuff before. I didn't know when we last spoke that one of your guilty pleasures was Vampire Diaries. Oh yeah, I, I love Vampire Diaries. <laughs> yeah. Um, so are you are you also a vampire well, diaries fan? So I started watching years ago, and then sure. I stopped watching. And then I was who was that? Vicky Leach, who's now at Bloomsbury. Yeah, um, sure. She was just like, do people still like Vampire Diaries? Because I I'm like beasting the whole series right now, and I was just like, you know, I should totally catch up. <laughs> it was pretty good. Like the the first three four seasons are actually really tight. Like. I know I do not look like the typical target <laughs> market audience member of TVD, but I actually had like when I when I first announced Empire of the Vampire years ago, I had a bunch of readers telling me that I should watch Vampire Diaries, and I thought, well, no, that's a show, <laughs> yeah. that's a show for teenage no. girls. Nothing wrong with that, but I am none of those things, so no, thank you. But then a couple of my writing buddies actually said that the plotting of it is actually really imaginative. Mm. Uh, the cool thing about it that I found was what lesser writers would have taken an entire season to stretch out, mm. they would do in like six or seven episodes and totally break the paradigm of their own world. Mm. Like they never really lost sight of the core idea, which is the love triangle between yeah. Damon and Stefan and Elena, but they exert different pressure on it in different ways all the time. And they're not afraid to just do something terrible and just break their own paradigm. Well, not break their own rules, but break the setting mm -hmm. so it's irrevocable. Like, it, you can't go back to the way it was. They're just kind of rushing forward always. So, yeah, Rebecca Sunshine and Julie Pleck were really on it. They're great writers. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's just a really cool exercise and exploration in those, those monsters that we kind of grew up with. Mm -hmm. Like, the vampires that I wrote in Empire are more, you know, traditional horror yeah. types. Um, but, yeah. TVD kind of explored a bunch of different types. They had ancient monsters like Klaus and the originals, mm -hmm. but they also had the younger 
more romantic love interest type vibes and yeah I tell you the work I really love that show mm. it's great and it's it's quite interesting if it's able to because I think with a lot of shows say for things like True Blood which was a similar idea in the sense of you're exploring the world where kind of uh, vampires are, are quite commonplace and sure. the politics of the world and stuff but it kind of started going off the boil later series where they're just like and now we've got Faye and yeah. now we've got I mean most <laughs> most things tend to break with overuse that's yeah. That's kind of why I stick to trilogies. Like after <laughs> after three seasons, most shows have yeah. kind of done their thing, and mm. uh, yeah. But it's very rare where you'll see a television show where season five is better than season two. So yeah. I kind of apply that principle in my books. Like three books is out of my mouth. Um, yeah. <laughs> Even more. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Go go out on a high. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, yeah, things tend to break the more you use them. So uh, the early episodes of TVD were definitely better than the later mm. ones, but yeah. It was a great show. Well, it was great. Um, now, you write amazing characters. Oh, thanks. You write even better villains. I think the, the some of the, obviously, characters who are just evil to the core, and like, like you touched on before, but um, because we are like a food source. Sure. So it's very, you know, there there is no kind of thought to who this person is or what their life is kind of outside of. Um, so... Yeah, how do you how do you plot a believable and scary ass villain? Uh, I mean, it depends on the villain. the The fun that I had in vampires is that there's, and in damned as well. There's vampires of different ages. Mm. I figure you know the the guiding principle behind the world is that everything erodes with time, uh, including your morality. So the older you are, the more callous you get, the mm. more numb you are. Mm. You know, if you, if if you live a thousand years, you've done everything that you could possibly think of. Um, you know, whatever sensory experience you wanted to sample, you <laughs> would just do it. Uh, yeah. Particularly if you have, you know, godlike power and no one can stop you doing the things that you want to do, you would eventually just do everything. Um, and yeah, eventually that would just kind of numb you to your core. If you mm -hmm. kill somebody every night uh, to stay alive for a thousand years, you're going to stop seeing people as people and start seeing them as food. It's it's just the way it works. But, you know, that's kind of a idea that's as old as Anne Rice, you know, the mm. idea that everything erodes with time. So in the older vampires, yeah, they are almost alien. They, mm. they, they're they human in form, but they're completely inhuman in terms of the way they see the world and the people around them. Mm. So writing a character like Fabian, who is, you know, ostensibly the oldest vampire alive, yeah, uh, he is almost an alien intellect. Mm. Um, the only things, the things that kind of keep him moored uh, in his world that stop him just kind of going crazy uh, or just dying of boredom he's kind of driven by family I guess the the vampires that he have, he has created he doesn't necessarily like them he doesn't even necessarily love them but he considers them his mm. uh, and the legacy that he is building kind of keeps him moored so when Gabriel comes along and starts messing with that he takes a particular interest in Gabriel because like I say, if, if you've been alive for a thousand years and every every night is the same and all of a sudden mm. this guy pops up on your radar and starts spoiling your plans and destroying your lineage, that's something new at least. It might not be enjoyable, but at least it's intriguing. So, yeah, putting yourself into the mindset of something that old, it, it can be tricky, but it's a lot of fun. But the younger vampires are, are kind of more close to humans, so they mm. still have the remnants of the, their mortality. And then so a vampire like Celine that we spend a lot of time with in Damned, she's kind of struggling to reconcile the thing that she was with the thing mm. that she's becoming. So yeah, there, there's kind of different types of vampires and evil in the world, and yeah, that's one of the, that's one of the fun parts of writing. Um, but also in Damned, you get to see a little bit more of the, I guess the politics of the families, because these things are so old and they've been around so long, chances are good they've bumped into each other over the course of the last three, 400 years, and they've had, you know, bad romances and messy breakups and petty grudges that they've been nursing for the last three centuries and that's all kind of playing out on the backdrop of this rising war mm. um so yeah it, it's there's a bunch of different styles of vampire in the book i guess yeah. and yeah, uh, yeah it's a lot of fun to play with because i um recently i finally read fever dream i hadn't oh sure obviously. yeah and the um just the idea that and very much obviously the same with your books that yeah these these people have been around for hundreds of years and they 
they've built up not quite friendships necessarily but but yeah you know yeah. there's pe there's people that they trust them there's a society yeah, yeah. exactly um, the idea that there's like generations rather than a wealthy families there's generations of these vampire families like going back yeah and the, the interesting thing for me to write you know up until the advent of day's death these vampires kind of had to live in secret because mm -hmm. they were frightened of what would happen to them in this in during the day they're vulnerable during the day mm -hmm. So they had to form this kind of clandestine society that was hidden in the shadows. But now they've kind of had the last thing that kept them in check unleashed. And so the different families kind of react in different ways. Um, you know, the, the, the Devoc, who were one of the families that you spend a lot of time with in Damned, their supernatural gift is that, you know, all vampires are strong, the Devoc are stronger than regular vampires. Um, so that kind of informs their mindset. They're more a... Uh, they're less elegant, they're mm -hmm. more like a, a hammer to solve any problem. And so they kind of break the country that they're trying to take over because they hit it so hard. Whereas a vampire like Voss is a little more considered and, and careful. And so he's, he's having less of a terrible impact on the world around him in terms of immediate calamity. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, yeah, he's, he's a guy who sees people as food and he has an army to feed. So that's one of the things that I'm kind of playing around with in book three at the moment. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a lot of fun to play with these guys. Um, so there is, we can kind of um, touch on now like the, because you mentioned that obviously you're working on book three. Yeah. So a little under halfway through, I think. It'll probably it'll probably end up being a little bit longer than Vampire because mm. it's a book three, so there's a few more things to tie up. But I think I'm about 130k, and it'll probably end up being around 270 to 80. So I'm almost halfway done. Um, and I'm, the the I'm, ending's still up for. The very end is up for grabs. <laughs> I, I kind of know, I kind of know where. I liken it to driving a car at night with the headlight turned off, but I can see. <laughs> A city with the lights on in the distance so mm -hmm. as long as i kind of keep the car pointed towards the lights i'll eventually arrive at the city i'm not quite <laughs> sure what road i will take to get there but eventually i'll get there mm -hmm. so i kind of know yeah like i said i know who will be present for the final act but i have no idea who makes it out alive yet <laughs> so, we'll see. um we also have to obviously touch on your love of comics sure as well yeah um obviously while you're at <laughs> forbidden planet yeah the, the home of comics as well um so you've done some stuff recently in the DC universe, so how did that yeah. all come to pass and have you got new fans? Yeah, so I'm actually good buddies with a guy named Tom Taylor who's uh, just so happens I'm wearing the Nightwing <laughs> shirt today. Yeah, he's the writer on Nightwing. Uh, he did Injustice and Deceased and a whole bunch of big DC titles. He's a Melbourne boy, so he and I and another Melbourne writer, C.S. Picat, just get together every Thursday mm. and write in a cafe. And you know he was super busy doing Dark Knights of Steel. Uh, I think the annual that was mm. coming out, and they had forty pages, and he had a twenty-page story, and had twenty pages left over that he wanted to fill. And he asked if Cat and I wanted to write a ten-pager each, uh, which was awesome. I, <laughs> I kind of grew up reading comics. I never thought I would have the opportunity to write one. I wanted to be a comics artist when I was a very mm. young man. Um, but yeah, life didn't work out that way. But yeah, this kind of opportunity <laughs> fell in my lap. So yeah, I wrote a 10 pager for Dark Knights of Steel and the editor Ben really liked it. So he threw me, it was it was like a black and white illustration of Deathstroke uh, as a Viking. He was kind of, he, he was flying through the air with a couple of axes towards some skeletons and he just said, does this spark anything? Uh, and I kind of thought about it for a few weeks over Christmas, like last year and came up with a cool idea i thought it was a cool idea and pitched it to him and he really liked it so yeah i ended up i um, did a six-part series it's called all winter it's kind of set in the dark knights of steel universe but it's in a different part of the world that we didn't see in the first 12 issues and yeah it's it's kind of a viking style uh land that's locked in an eternal winter uh, and over the course of the book you kind of find out how and what slade's role in it is uh, working with a guy named Tierso Cons, who's a Spanish artist, he's amazing. Like the work that he's doing is just unreal. And I think the first issue comes out, I think June or July, mm -hmm. maybe July. Um, you know, the first two are done. We're doing the lettering on issue three right now. Um, 
but yeah, it was it was just kind of an opportunity in the film in my lap. It was one of those not what you know but who you know type yeah. things. Yeah, and I would never have imagined that I get to write a comic book one day. My wife was super jealous. I was actually a Marvel boy when I was young, and, <laughs> and she was a DC girl. Oh. And I ended up working for DC weirdly <laughs> enough. So yeah, but yeah, it was awesome fun. It was I used to write TV ads like when I had a day job when I was a civilian. I basically wrote TV scripts for mm -hmm. a living. So comic books are kind of structured a lot. There's a lot of similarities in the way they would get written. So it was actually more familiar ground for me than I first anticipated. And of course I had Tom there, like he's one of the greatest comic book writers alive. Uh, so if ever I, I had a question, he, the guy who wrote Injustice is like yeah. right there sitting <laughs> across the table from me. So yeah, it, it was a pretty cool, um, it was a pretty cool mentor to be up there rely on. So yeah, uh, it was a lot of fun. I kind of smashed out the six issues in, I think it was April last year while I was mm. waiting for edits on Damned to come back. Um, and so now like my, my job is done. Like writing comics is a lot less laborious in terms of time than drawing mm. them. Drawing them is just crazy. Yeah, the artists, yeah, they, they put in the hard yards. So I just kind of handed over the scripts and now I'm sitting back and watching panels come back every couple of days. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's really cool. But TSO is doing an amazing job. So yeah, mm. I can't wait for folks to see it. Yeah. It, it's very cool. Whenever um, next next time you're here, you'll have to come on a Wednesday because we get every single like issue of all the new comics. We get oh, cool. one of every one comes here. Oh wow! And then yeah, on nice. different like people's lunch breaks, you'll just like be going over to the box going, what are they and just <laughs> <laughs> and you just sure. read it and then just put it back. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's just there's there's so much amazing stuff happening yeah it was it was really cool to work with an elseworlds as well because you're not kind of beholden to the continuity mm. of the main dc world um so you know you're kind of taking the archetype of the character but if, just, if there's anything about them that you don't particularly like or want to rework you kind of have the freedom to do yeah. that so you know deathstroke is a character that's been around for like 40 years or something um so i i it was like a salad bar. I kind of took the things that I liked <laughs> and just left the rest. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I got to I got to play with a lot of really cool characters. I got to I, I don't think I can even say some of the characters that I got to use. But it was like, yeah, the, the idea that I would be entrusted with with those mm -hmm. characters that have such an extraordinary legacy. Yeah, it it was awesome. Um, but yeah, also just a lot of fun. It was it's mm -hmm. a really cool story. I'm really proud of it. So yeah, uh, yeah, I hope people like it. And if you had to write in any other universe, whether a novel or a comic book, is there any particular universe or character you'd like to do something with? Uh, I don't know. I, working on IP is interesting because you don't, you don't actually have control. Mm. You have the illusion of control, but <laughs> you can't. You can't break the toys, obviously, because other mm. people need to play with them as well. Um, and you don't actually own anything that you create. You're kind of working for hire. So mm. writing for DC was a lot of fun, but I was kind of conscious of the idea that everything that I was doing, it wasn't mine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of I like writing my own world. I like creating my own characters. I would I would rather write the new Star Wars than mm. be a guy who writes Star Wars. You know, yeah. not that I you know don't have enormous respect for those properties. I grew up watching them. I wouldn't be the writer that I am today if not for mm. stuff like Star Wars. But I would rather write the world that becomes the next Star Wars rather than work in someone else's sandbox. So yeah, it, it's it's fun to visit for a while. Um, yeah. But yeah, I yeah, I'm kind of I'm selfish that way. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, um, we were chatting uh, on FB TV the other day about, uh, I think, Event Horizon. Apparently there's going to be oh, a yeah. TV series and we were just saying how it'd be cool to kind of write in the Event Horizon universe, but then I'm not entirely sure where yeah, it's going to go. I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really wary about remakes and reboots yeah. and reinterpretations of things that were already awesome. I don't mm. know why you need to remake Event Horizon. It's a fucking great movie. Just leave it alone. Yeah. I don't know why you need to make a TV series of Avatar Last Airbender when yeah. the original Avatar Last Airbender was fucking mm. awesome. Just leave it alone. Uh, I understand why they do it because Hollywood executives think it's a safe bet. There's an audience 
that's already yeah. baked into the IP and they will come and watch it. Um, but yeah, I think as a creative and as a society, I think any society who looks with more fondness at the things they've done rather than the things they're going to do is in decline. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we should be lo yeah, looking for the new Star Wars, looking for the new Star Trek, looking for the new Airbender rather than just rehashing the same old shit. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe that's me, but <laughs> yeah, I, I understand the logic behind it. I understand why people want to go back and keep mm -hmm. revisiting these things they loved when they were kids because they loved them. Yeah. But it, you're like you're like a junkie chasing that first high. <laughs> it will never be as intense as it was when you were a kid because you're not a kid anymore. Mm. You, you'll never relive that moment when Vader tells Luke, I am your father. You will never feel that same way again because mm. you're not 10. Mm. Uh, so yeah, it, it's a weird one. Um, I get why people do it, but it yeah, as a as a creative, it's kind of troubling that we're more and more frequently going back and strip mining the properties mm -hmm. of the past rather than looking for the awesome ones of the future. But that's yeah. just me. No, that's fair. I think um, you get kind of I suppose you get burnt sometimes as well from say for example. Now I'm super nervous about Silent Hill Two remake sure. because the games. They, they obviously, maybe they haven't dated as well, but they, they are what they are for the time they were in. Yep. And now they're going to try and, you know, I don't know, kind of clean up the horror. And you're just like, well, part of the horror is I can't see what's out there. Yeah, you know, if you're sure. going to make it, you know, graphically, like, gorgeous, but then it removes the, what's <laughs> the, removes point of the doing scare, it? Yeah. then what's the point of doing it? Yeah, I, I, like, it, it could totally be done. Like, a great example of a remake that I thought was brilliant was the latest interview with the vampire TV yes. series. Did you watch that, yeah, that AMC show? Like yeah, what they did with that property, mm. like, uh, I don't want to spoil it for people <laughs> who haven't watched it. It's fucking brilliant. But like the idea that it's a reinterpretation of the text, but in the text, the text is conscious of what it's doing, that it's making a remake. It's mm. a revisit of mm. the interview that happened in the seventies set now. And the interviewer is kind of conscious of the fact because he's spoken to Lestat in the interim that Louis was kind of lying about some stuff mm -hmm. the first time they spoke and he's calling Louis out now about it. Like it was so clever and obviously the people who made it love that text. Yes. Like the way they approached it, they did it from a place of absolute reverence. Mm -hmm. But the way they reimagined it and respun it while being conscious of the fact that they were doing it, I, yeah, it totally worked. So it can. Like yeah. reboots and remakes can work. You just have to have, you have to have clever writers, good writers behind it. it, it yeah, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't want to poo-poo the idea of reinterpretations and reimaginings because yeah, interview was fucking sensational. I loved yeah. it, but just remaking it for the sake of remaking mm -hmm. it, just because you know there's people out there, and we want your fucking money. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that's that's a bad reason to do it. Yeah, at least to my mind. But what do I know? Oh yeah, no. I think having the having the right people in the room, like you said, it's it's people that clearly love. Yeah, yeah, and those guys love. You can tell, like yeah. it drips from every frame, like, mm. and like, you know, reimagining Anne Rice. You know, I wouldn't be the writer that I am today if not for Anne Rice. Mm. Those books were transformative for me as a kid. So you know, stepping up to that plate, you have an enormous responsibility playing with that property. But yeah, they pulled it off. They knocked it out of the park. Mm. I can't wait for season two. It's one of the best TV shows I've seen in ages. So yeah. Very, very good. It's, it's quite funny as well, just thinking about how a lot of people kind of like 30s, 40s and up grew up reading Anne Rice and Stephen King and sure. you know all those kind of classics. And I know you've had a bit of backlash from younger people kind of picking up empire and stuff so <laughs> yeah. you have become <laughs> the person that the, the parents fear <laughs> yeah i mean it's interesting it, like i have no problem with kids reading my books i mm. i read stephen king when i was 10. i yeah. started reading stephen king i read salem's lot when i was 10 years old probably a bit young to be reading salem's <laughs> lot um but i turned out okay for a, for a given measure of okay and yeah it, it depends on the kid like saying that you know what is true for one is true for all isn't necessarily true some kids mm -hmm. are more emotionally mature than others so if you're the right kid and you're 12 years old sure read my books but 
It's not that your parents catch you crying, I guess. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one who gets angry and emails about it afterwards. But I, like readers, my, some of my readers actually troll me that will, because I, I used to write YA, I think maybe some booksellers just simply for expedience will put all my books together yeah. on the one shelf. And so like Navanite and Empire will wind up in the YA <laughs> section next to Illumina and Aurora and stuff. I can get why a parent who walked into that YA section and picked up Empire and gave it to their kid might be upset that it wasn't actually <laughs> intended for kids. So yeah, I, I get it. But, you know, what doesn't kill them makes them stronger. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, to be fair, like, the booksellers are just going to do their own thing. Like, I'll, obviously, as a buyer, like, I'll code everything to be in a certain sure, sure. part of that the store. Sure, sure. That doesn't mean they're going to do it. doesn't mean they're going to put it there. <laughs> so... You just wander into one of our stores and go, oh, okay. Yeah, no, readers send me <laughs> pictures of Empire in the wire section all the time. It's, yeah, yeah. it's become a meme now, which is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. So, um, the last couple of questions for today's interview. So, the, uh, obviously, music is a huge part, I think, of your books and just you personally. Yeah, sure. Um, so, how important is, uh, have you got, like, a playlist for each one of your books and how important is is music um yeah i i put together a playlist for both the empire books and i think dark dawn um and they're up on spotify somewhere um in terms of when i'm writing i can't listen to anything with lyrics because mm -hmm. the words kind of get in the way of my words so i'm usually listening to orchestral pieces or movie scores are another really good mm -hmm. one like that music is meant to evoke a certain feeling. So if you're writing an action scene and you put on some big bombastic piece of epic music that can help put you in the zone as you're writing. Um, but yeah, when I'm walking around and thinking and brainstorming ideas, I tend to lis listen to a lot of bands. Uh, yeah, that, that write interesting lyrics. I mean, we don't really have poets anymore uh, mm -hmm. to me bands and, and the lyrics and songs are the modern day equivalent of poetry and there's some extraordinary writers out there so yeah a lot of the themes and lyrics that I listen to will in one way or shape or form kind of bleed into the books that I'm writing at the time mm -hmm. and I try with the Empire books I try and pick a song uh, that is evocative of the entire book and take a snippet of that at the I think it's called an epigraph mm -hmm. kind of at the front of the book so and the one we used in Vampire was from a Lamb of God song, uh, written by the guitarist, fucking fine. <laughs> People are after you. It's all good. Um, yeah, it's launch day. Um, so yeah, that, that's a song called Walk, Walk With Me In Hell, um, written by the guitarist, Mark Morton. And weirdly enough, segue, one of my readers is also a Lamb of God fan, and he sent a photo of the epigraph to Randy, who's the lead singer of Lamb of God. And I was just going through my DMs on Instagram one day and I see a message from D. Randall Blythe and I'm like, wait a minute, that's, that can't be right. I clicked on it and there was a picture of Randy from Lamb of God, who's one of my favourite bands of all time and he's got a picture of Empire the Vampire in his hand <laughs> saying, I can't wait to read it. And now we're buddies, so yeah, <laughs> life is weird sometimes. Um, and yeah, the quote that I use at the front of Damned is from an Architect song, who are one of my favourite bands, UK band. Um, from an album, it's called All Our Gods Have Abandoned Us, it was written, it was the last album they had that they wrote with their old guitarist, a guy named Tom Searle, who passed away really sadly. Mm. Uh, he died of cancer when he was like 28 years old. And he was conscious of the fact that he was quite ill when they were writing that album. Um, and maybe that it was the last album that he was ever gonna record. So him kind of grappling with his illness and mortality and the concept of death and permanence and impermanence kind of permeates the whole text mm. of that album so that's kind of in line with some of the themes in Damn. so yeah I, I used a quote from Tom at the front of Damn. they were nice enough to let us use his words so that was super cool as well but yeah it, it, it can it can depend on a scene some characters can mm. have songs that I kind of associate with them um, some scenes can have songs that I associate with them so yeah I try and bash them all together into a playlist at the end and um, yeah hopefully that evokes some kind of mood about the book um, but yeah it's usually all metal so yeah. uh, uh, my playlists were uh, made to frighten the children <laughs> but fair enough fair enough there's there's certain things i know whenever i'm doing invoices because it's the the dullest part of my job i have to put some really heavy, oh. heavy music on just to get through watch your fave watch your fave band right uh, now give me a wreck well this 
I didn't realise. I, I used to be a huge Glass Jaw fan, and I didn't oh, realise yeah. that Daryl's done some star side stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I've been listening to that recently. I'm just huh. Like, interesting. Okay, this yeah. is, this is this is good. I saw so Glass Jaw were last over like 2019. They kind of did a couple of gigs. Yeah, right. So I managed to see them, which was very cool. But um, I kind of feel I'm at a point where I keep going back to like all the bands I used to listen to, and uh, I don't know that many kind of new bands. Oh, really? So I, 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 I was like I'll a huge System rest. fan. Oh, yeah, so I, I, Always. Um, and I saw uh, Surge had a book come out last, last year, so I was just like, oh, we have to have Surge's as well. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but yeah. So I, you've I reached that some... point. That means you're officially old. This you're is, looking this with is, more fondness is, at the bands good. that you used to listen to than the you're new just ones. Like, you know, some, when a certain song like kicks in or whatever, and you just like, <laughs> you can Yeah, just, no, like, I get it, but you, you, you can't, like, I'll, no, I'll, I don't wanna, I'll give like, you some new stuff. I don't want to admit to be No, just, you can't, yeah, you can't. So. Like, I went and saw, uh, who did we see? Mudvayne and Cold Chamber. <gasps> oh my God. Like, two weeks ago. <laughs> Sweet Jesus. And they're like, they're old dudes now, yeah. like they're as old as me. It's oh like, my oh, God. Man, I feel sorry for them still schlepping around a guitar on stage. But yeah, no, I'll, I'll give you some reps on new <laughs> okay, stuff. There's good. a lot of amazing good. new stuff that you get in Oh my it. God. I just saw it, the cold chamber thing where every dude in my school had flats. Oh yeah. <laughs> and if you, were, if you were, had enough testosterone, you would grow yourself yeah, a scraper yeah, and it would go yeah. and braid it. Yeah, yeah I did yeah. all that shit. <laughs> <laughs> too good, too good. Um, so to finish the interview today, so um, what are you currently reading, watching, and if you game, what are you playing? I'm currently reading a manuscript for a buddy of mine, uh, which I can't talk about yet. Um, that's, a, that's a terribly boring answer, I know. <laughs> um, and I also just recently, like when I'm drafting, I tend to read a lot of non-fiction. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want people's ideas to kind of bleed into mine. So I read a book called The Coddling of the American Mind by Jonathan Haidt and Greg Luciano, which is kind of about the impact on social me of social media and various parenting practices that are kind of shaping the way kids are growing mm -hmm. up these days. It's a really interesting book, but it's nonfiction. So um, it's not a great wreck for genre fans. In terms of TV, I just watched True Detective Night Country. I just finished that. We just finished season four of Succession, which was awesome. Um, and now we're watching the new series of Drive to Survive. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the Formula One. Formula One uh, Yeah. Um, and what was the other question? Uh, do you game? Oh, gaming, yeah. yeah. I'm playing Elden Ring at the moment. Yeah. yeah. I had no idea how big that game was. Huge. Yeah, no. I was DLC coming out at some point. Yeah, I'm never, <laughs> I'm never gonna finish. Like I was a massive uh, fan of Dark Souls and Bloodborne, mm. uh, but they're kind of self-contained units. You yes. play them for like 80, 80 hours and you're done. Mm. I've been playing Elden Ring for like 200 and I'm only like 30% into it. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I'll be playing this game for the rest of the year, but yeah, it's amazing. It's a lot of fun, but there's a lot of it. <laughs> It's a big, big chunk of game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to play uh, Baldur's Gate Three. I've heard great things about it, but I honestly don't know when I'll get to do no, that. That's another like I haven't got around to Baldur's Gate Three yet, but that's another big. That's huge. Yeah, it's a big game. which is cool. People get their value for money, but yeah, god damn, I want to <laughs> do something else other than play a video game for a year. Yeah, <laughs> anyway. yeah, it, yeah, it's a lot, and I think like I've been playing uh, Yakuza like a dragon to get ready for the new Yakuza that's yeah, just coming right. out and that's I, ha I hate that I have this mindset where I'm just like oh, I have to try and platinum it I never do <laughs> but I try <laughs> yeah. for a period of time so, <laughs> so just like about three months three four months you'll just be like oh yeah I'm gonna do everything and you're like, no skip to the end <laughs> yeah no it's a very rare game where I do all the things I, mm. I think the last time I 100 proceeded hundred percent of the game was Arkham City maybe yeah the Batman game like I I I loved that game like a man <laughs> loves his wife <laughs> way <laughs> too much time playing Arkham City but yeah that was the last time I hundred percent of the game that was like I don't know seven eight years ago I got books to write now so I'm yeah, sure your time is yeah I, I got better things to do with my time yeah, fair enough and your last question what are you most looking forward to doing whilst you're in the UK this time I'm actually going to the Games Workshop factory <gasps> up in Nottingham. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah, a friend of mine told me that it's awesome. Oh I God. haven't played 40k or anything like that in ages. I used to play way too much of it when I was younger. So yeah, but I've heard the factory tour is actually really interesting and cool. So we've got the day off before the Nottingham gig. So I'm going to drag my wife along. She, she has no <laughs> idea what she's in for, but she puts up with a lot of my garbage so she'll have to put up with this as well but yeah i'm really looking forward to that it'll it, be cool it's very good i went last year so my uh boyfriend's written some short stories for warhammer oh yeah so cool we went up to have a look and we met mike brooks for biz as right, well so right. he lives nearby um so it's the coolest head offices yeah okay. uh, it's like oh why are our offices why don't we have like giant mechs outside and like <laughs> yeah. a nurgle in i mean you've got your lego r2d2 we That's do have cool. a lego r2d2 yeah i suppose it's better, um, it's better but yeah also just meeting readers like it's actually <laughs> yeah like meeting readers is the best part of the job it sounds corny to say that but most of the time i'm sitting in my study talking to people that live in my head <laughs> the only human contact that i have is with the barista down the corner of the coffee shop where i go every day um so yeah it's actually cool to be out on the road and, and see readers i didn't get to tour on vampire because mm -hmm. it came out kind of at the end of covid so everything was still locked down so this is the first time i've actually got to meet readers and talk to them mm -hmm. about the first book as well so yeah really looking forward to it it'll be cool so yeah, cool thanks okay. for to everyone who comes out and sees me on the road <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's gonna be a few people <laughs> yeah it'll be cool yeah very cool well thank you so much for for joining us today and obviously we've, we've got some books to sign so we'll get on with that and there'll be signed copies available on our website and in all of our stores within the next few days so see you next time bye, bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.